the word dramatic, we overuse it probably uh, at times, but that truly was the real deal there. I mean, uh, it was just Jerry Hutch found not guilty and then walking out the court room just added to the moment and he, he stopped and had a word with you he alone. Did. He chatted away. Now, I mean, obviously, it was just a quick, brief word. What happened was, oh my, I'm, my heart's still racing yeah. after all that. And I just want to say, anybody who's driving past the courts, yeah. the media were not in their full glory today. What no. happened was, um, there was a kind of like constant, you know, when these things happen, they happen really quickly at the end, don't they? Even they though do. we've been sitting all day in court listening to these very lengthy judgments, which we will go into now in a minute, but... Um, he's found not guilty and he's free to go. Yeah. So I mean, it's like, it's, how it's, do you get out? How does he go, go out? Obviously, the Byrne family had to leave. There was, you know, nobody wanted them to clash. There was a huge amount of media out the front. Um, and everybody was around the side because they thought Jerry was going around the side. And then I just thought I'd go back into the courts and just see where he is. And as I went back in, he was kind of coming down and he'd been asked just to wait for a minute because the Burns were leaving. So they didn't go out at the yeah. same time. So he did. He'd no problem. And I just said to him, how are you? And yeah. he's really shy. And I think he was really blown away, as probably everybody else was. He did say to me that, you know, he thought, he always thought it was going to be the verdict. But I suppose if you're sitting in prison, you know, and you're you're facing life, you yeah. know, you, you might think I mean, there's, was, this should be the verdict. But yeah, I mean, it's not the state, the obvious, but he had so much riding on it. I mean, mm. he's turned 60 last week. The average amount of time people send, spend in prison for a life sentence is 20 years now at this point. So you really, although he's been there in prison a year or so on remand, you'd mm. be talking he would have been in his late 70s, yeah. the end of his life, really. If 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 at all, many people die before they reach their late 70s. There would have been a reluctance to let a gangland killer out early. So really, everything was at stake. Mm -hmm. He walks out of court now, an innocent man. He's probably independently wealthy and he can go and live the last third of his life or whatever in, in great comfort. I mean, there is everything was at stake. So and he, you know, he was he was I think he just couldn't kind of gather his thoughts. Do you know that yeah. he was standing there? He was looking out. He could see this absolute wall of cameras. Yeah. And he was going out that front door. Yeah. Because he was entitled to go out that front door. Um, as an innocent man. Yeah. And um, yeah, he just said, you know, it was a great judgment. And he said that they he, he he said that his legal team, he couldn't be more grateful to his legal team. And that was very solicitors. And obviously, uh, Brendan Grehan, senior yeah. counsel, represented him and um, that they had put up a fantastic case for him. Fantastic defense. He said that I asked him where he was headed. Was he going north or was he going abroad? He didn't really. He sort of yeah. giggled at the idea that I was asking him such a cheeky question. He said uh, he, he was just going out the door, basically. And um, otherwise, he said that he thought it was a great judgment. He thought the judges, the three judges, of course, because it was on his side that they were brilliant. He might have been saying the Though opposite. He, he does walk out of court, an innocent man, yeah. found not guilty of murder. However, the judgment is not... Um, maybe so clear in that um, it does at least suggest that that he was part of this Hutch criminal organisation and that um, he mm. was involved. He it, the judgment recognises that he, at the very least, had control of the weapons used in the Regency. Um, obviously, Jerry Hutch is 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 not guilty of murder. Mm. Absolutely an innocent man in that context. Of course, we spoke about the Byrne family. They were there in court. They're walking out of court, presumably feeling devastated, unhappy. They did shout a couple of things about uh, one one member of the family at the media saying, you know, I don't know what he has on you. Who? Um, one member of the Byrne family oh, shouted, shouted at the... I at don't the, know what he has on you, you as uh, in what Jerry Hutch has on, on the, the media. media. So there was, right. you know... But so, that narrative has been going on since the very beginning. Yeah. That narrative has been going on since the day that Regency Hotel attack happened. And that narrative was originally put out by Daniel Kinahan that the state, in collusion with the Hutch gang yeah. and with the media, yeah. conspired to murder Daniel Kinahan that day. Yeah. I mean, that has been put out in yeah. a book, in a documentary and in a rap song, which he has paid to have released. Yes. And it has really deeply embedded within it certainly the Byrne organisation. I mean, and you can see, in fact, the opposite is true, that the state really went after Jerry Hutch as, mm. as hard as it possibly could. And we're left with huge egg on their face, as this judgment is pretty damning, I think. It is pretty damning. To in the terms state of, and to decisions that have been made. Yeah, I mean, so I suppose it's a, 
I mean, I presume it was 80, 90 page judgment that went out over mm. five or six hours. But to, to summarise it, um, will be difficult. Will be difficult. But why don't we start where the day started? Yeah. And that was, 17th of April was the day that the judges told us that they would have the um, the verdicts if they hadn't before it. Yeah. And when they came out, uh, Justice Tara Burns, Justice uh, Sarah Berkeley, and Justice Gronia Malone sat and, and Tara Burns told us that they had literally, they had hoped to have it earlier, but they literally worked into the early hours of this morning. They yeah. pulled an all-nighter yeah. to, to, to get this um, judgment together for today. So yeah. they were right up to the wire and that was because of pressures on, on time, yeah. the judiciary, and they were all, she said, working on different cases. But we got there for 10 o'clock. There was a big queue going out uh, round the corner of the courts and past the lifts. Yeah. Um, and media were first into the court. It got underway at 11 o'clock, at which point the two earlier verdicts, which yeah. we'll come back to, yeah. Jason Bonney and Paul Murphy were both found guilty. Yes. Uh, essentially of driving the getaway cars. Yes, facilitation. Um, and facilitating the, the murder of David Byrne. But we'll come back to them. Yeah. That brought us to lunchtime. Yeah. At which point there was a three quarter of an hour break and Jerry Hutch yeah. was brought back at a quarter to two when his judgment yeah, very so efficiently got underway and I, I have to find where this is now. Well, screen. I think there was in the general media pack at lunchtime, people, yeah. people, a couple of people came up to me after the two guys were found guilty and said, oh, it's not looking good for That's Jerry. That's what everyone said to me as well. Yeah. I was like, no, I think it's looking really good. Because, you know, obviously they, they've been found guilty and it looked like there was a sense then that the, the tide was turning against, against uh, Hutch. However... The judgment pretty quickly went into the, the, like as we said again and again. There was two real key pieces of evidence. It was Jonathan Dowdle's witness statement and what he suggests had happened, and there was also the long uh, hours of uh, audio recordings mm -hmm. made during their trip. I mean, that's really what it came down to, isn't it? There wasn't really. Yeah, I mean, she opened by saying the case against Jerry Hutch was that he was one of the two shooters yes, so this is who a... murdered David Byrne at the Regency Hotel. And that was from the very offset that we were very clear about that, that it was the state's case that Jerry Hutch didn't kind of direct this, no. that he wasn't part of it, that he was actually one of the shooters. They really laid their cards down the state yeah, on that. Yeah, like it wasn't. I mean, obviously there's been people that have been convicted of murder for, say, ordering hits mm. or and it's, it's joint association where... Although they didn't pull the trigger, they're involved intimately in the planning. And that's totally normal under Irish law. You can be convicted without literally pulling the trigger. But that wasn't the case that the state made. And mm. I think even at the in the opening statement, that was the big surprise. That was the big surprise to all of us. Where they, they, they said that Jerry Hutch was one of the tactical team. Yeah. One of the guys dressed as Gardaí. Mm. And I don't think anybody had really... I think most people had thought he might have been a getaway driver but, but I think from the offset, people thought that the military precision of the Regency attack was, you know, had the monk written all over it. I mean, yeah. he is suspected of having, um, you know, carried out two of the most incredible heists in the in the history of the state. And uh, while he hasn't been convicted of that, of either of them, I think it's generally, you know, said that he yeah. probably... Planned them. That's what said. He's publicly denied that. Yeah. However, you know, he's made settlements with Cab and, yeah. you know. And it's it's generally said now at this stage. But uh, yeah, so the idea then that he was one of the shooters and of course, then you go back and you look and you, you think those shooters were running around that hotel. Yeah. And they were very uh, nimble. Yeah. I mean, one of them jumped up on a on the reception desk to shoot David Byrne as he lay injured on the ground and they jumped back down again and they were kind of, they were very, very active and that was kind of like a bit of a, a moment for me as well. I was like, you know, he's kind of getting on, Jerry Hutch. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's um, 60, obviously, so he would have but been... But yes, they, 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 so so the, the judgment was that this case is that he was present and an actual participant, an actual shooter. And I think they said that the evidence of Jonathan Dowdall um, was... Vital. He, yeah. he said that that Jerry Hutch confessed to him after the Regency that he was the shooter. He yeah. was the one who killed David Byrne. 
Um, so, yeah, so it goes back to the prosecution's case as it was laid out was that there was central, a couple of central planks to it. And one of the, the central planks was Jonathan Dowdle. The, this admission, this alleged admission, mm -hmm. this admission now that we can say is not accepted and was ju judged to be not credible in court in a court of law that, that Jerry Hutch had basically broken with the habit of a lifetime and said to Jonathan Dowdle, that was me that shot them. Mm. Um, and that was a key bit of the state's case. Um, so, I mean, they initially, she she read out a kind of a background of the Regency, um, what had happened, you know, how David Byrne had lost his life, the, the kind of the weapons that had been done. And then at that point, then she went into a th some mention of the Hutch Criminal Organization and then really started going into the Jonathan Dowdle uh, evidence mm. and it really was uh, a and slaughterhouse I think it's fair to it say. It was I mean look Jonathan Dowdall has been completely dismissed as a witness. Yeah. He is a liar. Yeah. He is a, a criminal with yeah. serious a serious criminal past. Yeah. He is uh, has friendships with serious figures in the IRA. Yeah. Dangerous criminals. Um, and also they went in a little bit into the John Gilligan appeal, yes. which which I think I mentioned before in the pod. Yeah. And this was when somebody is basically an accomplice and they're a witness. Yeah. That you have to be cautious, like the judges yeah. or a jury yeah. have to be cautious with that evidence because this person has gained from giving evidence or certainly could feel that they are going to gain in their treatment by the state or in, in the case of Jonathan Dowdall, he was facing a murder charge himself yeah. and that charge was dropped. Yeah. And he, he pleaded guilty to a far lesser offence, which is the same as, as the facil facilitation, a role in the facilitation of, of the, the murder. And he's, so what did he get? Four years and he's appealing it. Yeah. So <coughs> appealing the sentence, uh, appealing the, 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 so she went. And did you catch, was it 10 days before he was due to go on, on he finally, trial for murder? Mm, he finally gave the witness statement in, in 10 days. Yeah. So, I mean, they went into, so as you said, they the went wire. into the, 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 the Gilligan verdict. What she what she said was that, you know, if somebody is an accomplice or uh, has involvement and they're then giving a witness statement, that is something that there is a danger to that. Mm -hmm. And the, it should be treated with caution whether you take the evidence they give if it can't be corroborated. Yeah. If it can be corroborated, it should be accepted. She said that even if somebody is involved... Corroborated. <laughs> what say it? Corroborated. <laughs> Corroborate. Corroborate. Say it after me. Co corroborate. So <laughs> like I know, I know, I know. Draws. So they, um, she said, um, <laughs> she said that they can't take this evidence though, but it, there is a danger to it, and that if they're not, uh, if it's not, um, try a different word. Try a different word. <laughs> <laughs> no, if it's not backed up. Go on. If it's not backed up, yet, yeah, there is a danger to taking it, but it can be taken, but it has to be. There yeah. has to be. And in doing that, she said that basically, you know, the special criminal court and the judges, I mean, she defended actually the special criminal court and the, the judiciary as yeah, well. In yeah, a way. Yeah. That was I thought that was quite interesting because um, she said like that the special criminal court, although it's a three judge court, it has to behave as if it's a jury as well. And yeah. it has to take these sort of rules and regulations and advice that's there for a jury and, and very much apply it. Um, and at the beginning, she had spoken about that there had been commentary that judges basically didn't live in the real world. Yeah. So they wouldn't really be able to properly make judgments. But yeah. actually, she said, we three very much live in the real world, very much deal with kind of real problems. And we are, you know, we're yeah, very yeah. keyed in to what and is the, going on. And it was the whole judgment was in very ordinary language, actually, yeah. wasn't it? It was. It was. It there was. I mean, legally, was. there was there was legal there was legal basis to absolutely everything. Yeah. But it was just explained, I thought, in a very, very distinct um, and simple fashion. There was. The pronounced corroborated, right? But she corroborated. Did, try again. No. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Backed up. Anyway, so on. where are we? We're so um, so that that's, that's that was like so that was that was the context in which they then discussed Jonathan Dowdle's witness statement. We're gonna talk about Jonathan Dowdle. Yeah. Um so we're gonna talk about Jonathan Dowdle. Yeah. He was completely dismissed. Yeah. yeah. Everything he said yeah. was dismissed. Yeah. The uh, incident where he claimed that he went to Whitehall Park and that uh, 
that Jerry Hutch uh, had told him that he was had killed David Byrne. That was completely and utterly dismissed. Yeah. On the basis that he changed the narrative of that from the very beginning. He initially said that he had met him um, at some point bef- after Neddy Hutch was killed. Then he said it might have been on the Monday, yeah. the day Neddy Hutch was killed. Then he said it might have been on the Sunday. Then he spoke about the Sunday World newspaper and identifying from that uh, photograph on the front of that paper that week, yeah. um, Patrick Hutch, who he said he could recognise from as the, the, the man dressed as a, a woman running from the hotel. Of course, that picture was pixelated and you couldn't recognise anybody. Else. No, you couldn't, especially since he was dressed as a woman, which make it even yeah. more difficult to 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 look at. Um, so she also she spoke about his motivation for giving a statement mm-hmm. um, in terms of the, you know, that it was uh, there was self-interested um, that mm-hmm. there was a motivation for him to do that. And um, she also spoke about uh, how if somebody like Jerry Hutch had admitted to a crime like that to you in Whitehall Park, that that would be something that I think the term was seared into your memory yeah. that yeah, um, that it wasn't, wouldn't be something that you would be unsure of what day it was, what time of day it was. And that she also made a, a an issue that, that Jonathan Dowdle uh, was in court saying, I remember this 100% mm-hmm. when it was pointed out to him, well, this might not be. He just changed his opinion and said, no, yeah. that's not 100%. That's, in fact, it could be this or it could not be that. Um, she said it didn't seem credible, I think, uh, Jerry she, Hutch making this admission, yeah. which is a big, big... Well, I think big... she said that basically if he did, right, yeah. and he said that he'd murdered a senior yeah. Kinahan associate yeah. and that he told you that, that yes, it would have made a, a searing impression on your, your yeah. memory. And also that she spoke later about the tapes and how, you know, there was times when Jerry Hutch spoke about the people, I suppose, that, that yeah. carried out the Regency Hotel and they're in the car and they're driving north, these famous tapes. Yeah. But at no point does does Dowdle say, but sorry, you said you did it? Yeah, yeah. And and also, Jerry Hutch, if he has said this before, why, when he knows, he obviously doesn't know he's being taped, why would he go back on that and then pretend that he doesn't know? Yeah. I mean, it just, it doesn't make logical sense. Yeah. And of course, that was part of their judgment that they said that when they discuss circumstantial evidence and other types of evidence, that it has to make sense to an ordinary person as a, as a juror, which were they are acting in this case as as well as the mm-hmm. judges. Now they spoke about um, the idea of Jonathan Dowdall acting as this sort of in be you know as this mediator between the Hutches and the dissidents and bringing them together and asking them for help in the Hutch Kinahan feud, and she said that that it was beyond reasonable doubt that um, Jonathan Dowdall was asked by Patsy Hutch yeah. to use his IRA contacts so as he could you know try and bring them to the table. Um, the court was satisfied, of course, that the journey that the father and son made, Patrick and, and Jonathan Dowdall, happened on the 4th of February and that they had an earlier visit as well in relation to this end. Um, they were happy that the the, the uh, conversations and that the sorry, that the, the journeys had happened as well on the 20th of February and the 7th of March, that they were recorded, that the National Surveillance Unit were in place in, in certain areas and they were watching them as they went up, I think, on the 20th of February to meet with Shane Rowan. Um, they said that they had seen that Jerry Hutch was seen outside Jonathan Dowdall's house um, at that time. He was getting a lift up with him and I think he was caught on CCTV um, cameras that were in. They talked about um, the 7th of March. That's when the surveillance and the audio. They were satisfied that that Jonathan Dowdall drove um, drove him to Straban and that they met we and Shane Rowan. And then they met this army council. Now, had you known that Tommy Me- Tommy Mellon was mentioned before? I think he was mentioned. Was but he mentioned before? He was mentioned during the course. Or did we kind of work out that it was him? No, I think he was mentioned, but it was that was maybe a, a clearer putting him in there. Tom Thomas or Tommy Ash Mellon, of course, yeah. is a very well known. Uh, he was one of them that it was in the group yeah. that they went out onto the the, the which was described the in court the as the Northern Command of of the IRA. Exactly. Now, they accepted that the um, during these conversations, they refer again and again to these three yokes. Yeah. And the court accepted that the um, the yokes were indeed the AK-47s yeah. that were used in the Regency Hotel. And the court accepted that Jerry Hutch was the man in control of them and the one who was sort of directing them being yes. handed up to the Northern 
command. So basically what they said was that, that Jerry's, Jerry Hutch and Jonathan Dowdle are talking about these weapons. Clearly, uh, Jerry Hutch is the person who's going to decide what has been done with these, these weapons mm -hmm. that they are to be given to the IRA. However, they did draw a distinction by saying this is in the aftermath of the Regency. That's what the tapes show, that mm -hmm. he has control of the weapons at this point, which is in the weeks after. Um, it doesn't automatically show that he was in control of the weapons in advance of the Regency. Mm -hmm. It may That may be the case, that may not be the case, but th those they tapes... They didn't accept that it was beyond reasonable doubt yes. that he was, essentially. Um, they talk about, she talked about the Hutch family, um, Justice Tara Burns, and she said that... Uh, of course, evidence was given by you know, Detective Rank, right? Detective Gallagher, Superintendent yeah. um, David Gallagher. Yeah. And um, he, she said that that evidence was inadmissible against Jerry Hutch as it only is, is admissible as opinion evidence. Yes. But the court, she said, was satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that members of the Hutch family were responsible for the murder of David Byrne yes. and that they had carried out that. Um that the, they were in the possession of the AK-47s used in the Regency and um, that basically the uh, that there was the involvement of Patsy Hutch in the handover of guns, that there was that, that Patsy Hutch was in possession of the AK-47s and was arranging uh, the booking of the room. They accepted yeah. that. I mean, there was a, quite a damning acceptance beyond reasonable doubt of a lot of there was against I mean, Patsy Hutch and of course on the way back here we drive past his house and we see a squad car still sitting out there absolutely I mean it's it's it was Patsy Hutch is referred to and constantly in the evidence definitely more than and than Jerry Hutch and her I think the point that the judges were making is that Patsy Hutch is situated in Birmingham Village for example which again Buckingham. was a Buckingham Village sorry which is a key uh, which is a, a flat complex in the north inner city from which uh, the convoy and flat cap left before going to the Regency and then subsequently a number of them returned there. And she, the judges, or Justice Tara Burns said, Patsy Hutch is there, he's situated there. We know that Jonathan Dowdle talked to Patsy Hutch after booking the, the Regency hotel room. Mm -hmm. So Patsy Hutch is situated there, but the point was made that Jerry Hutch is not situated during those events. Yeah. He is not in Buckingham Village. The key card to Buckingham Village, which also was a, a key bit of evidence, um, was found in Patsy Hutch's home. It wasn't found in Jerry Hutch's home. And that the point was made, which you've made on the podcast as well, that they cannot even be 100% sure that Jerry Hutch was even in the country at the time. I don't think they've anything to suggest no, that. No, no. I don't think they're even 1% sure that he's in the country. Well, the they time. are. Yeah, they, they certainly don't have the evidence. They've they have been. clearly said that they think he's they he believe it, there. They've nothing to back exactly. that up. Exactly. So that was that was a that was a lot of, of, of this bit about the, there was a, a phone found in the glove box. It's called the glove box phone. Yeah. Of a taxi that was being used by Jonathan Hutch, who's a nephew of the monk. Yeah. His father was John Johnny Hutch. Hutch. Yeah. John Hutch Senior. Who, senior. Who passed away uh, due to a, he fall had a in tragic his home. accident in the home, but yeah. he had previously um escaped two attempted yes, assassination the, attempts yes. one in Turkey and one in Dublin yeah one very serious attempt mm. in Dublin for which a number of senior uh, Kenyan cartel people are behind bars um, now what this judgment says is that this phone was only activated on the day of the Regency along with other yeah. phones and they have the communication between these phones there was 10 euro credit put on yeah. each of them and they were kind of buzzing between one another yeah. during the hours that the Regency attack was just before it was happened and just in after the and, then, and in the getaway. And um, the judgment says categorically it was the Hutches at yeah. the Regency um, that the, it, the that the court is satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that members of the family carried out the assassination of yeah. David Byrne. However, that it's not the case that Jerry Hutch is here to meet no. that he's here to meet a case that he was actually present in the shooter. Yes. So there was again a distinction to say it wasn't the case that he was facing was not a case of conspiracy mm -hmm. or a weapons case or a case of facilitation of, of the Regency murder or a case of murder by joint design. The case against Jerry Hutch was he was one of the three guys dressed as Gardy who shot David Byrne. And one of the two who shot him. And that, that, that was the evidence that wasn't 
reached in this case. Yeah. And that that was clear. Um, on Jonathan Dowdle, they were really quite damning um, on his motivation for bringing his witness statement forward. It was it. it the, the judge said it cannot be said that Jonathan Dowdle has found it, found God and acted out of, uh, it, it, you know, acted out of conscience. He acted out of self-interest is what they say mm -hmm. um, that there was a significant benefit from providing a statement to Gardaí that Jonathan Dowdle uh, said in court, he will come back from this. That's what they, they, they quoted that line, that he he has a chance of getting on with a normal life, that even the judge sort of said that he will be able to. He's a businessman. He's a talented And a tradesman, politician. A tradesman, an elected a, politician. Yes, and that he because he has given this statement and he's been accepted into the witness protection program, he will now live in another country and he will be able to get on with his life. Mm. And therefore, there was a significant benefit to him giving this statement and that while assessing that benefit, that has to be taken in conjunction with the character of Jonathan Dowdle. Um, and then they absolutely slaughtered his character. Yeah. Um, because I mean, they, he's never going to get in and give give evidence again. No, and which is really, really probably the one of the things of huge significance because we've written and you wrote over the weekend about how, no matter what the outcome of this case, the uh, the investigation into the Hutch organised crime group goes on and maybe even be has been picking up speed in recent times. So you have a number of people who may or may not face charges in relation to the Regency Hotel. There's also investigation into the leaking of private or of, of sensitive information from from the state. And then there's the operation of the gang in total. Mm. Now, there is no doubt that Jonathan Dowdle has uh, would have been a really good witness if those cases were to come to pass. If if Jonathan Dowdle had his evidence had been accepted in this case, he could have come back for five, six, seven other cases. He would have been a very key witness if he conducted himself in a way that the that was believable and but it credible. Was more honest because because what they did say was, you know, a criminal can be a witness they and they can have they can have, you know, what I mean, you, you you'll take caution yeah. by what they're saying, but you know, and you'll you'll take everything into account, but they can actually have go good evidence and be a witness, but. He only wanted to give evidence that he wanted yes, to give, and he didn't want to admit, which you were always saying, if he had just said no, hands up, I did this. Exactly. He didn't want to admit anything. And particular, his relationship with Macaulay, yeah. Pierce Macaulay. Because, I mean, they were just... How a, was he described? He was described he as a notorious terrorist yeah. and a very dangerous person. Um, Pierce Macaulay obviously was one of the, uh, was had been a member of the Provisional IRA. He was involved in the death of... of uh, Guard Jerry McCabe. Guard Jerry McCabe. And after he got out of prison, he was involved in a very horrific case of domestic violence. Yeah. Um, so and Dowdall said he didn't really know him. And, and they, you know, he was questioned about, but did you not go and see him? And when he was in the witness box, he said, no, 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 I, I hardly ever went to see him. I might have seen him once until they produced the prison records, which yeah. showed that he was up with him once a week. And I mean, and although that like that doesn't go to the heart of the Regency but it's so case. But stupid. How do you think you're going to get away with that? Exactly. But that is kind of what the, what they got to the heart of with Jonathan Dowdle. Yeah. He was a liar. a liar. And he lied yeah. big and he lied small. Yeah. He lied possibly when he didn't even have to. Couldn't lie straight in bed, as they say. Couldn't lie straight in bed. Yeah. And also then they gave, went into a good bit of detail about the um, the case that Jonathan Dowdle ultimately served, I think it was eight years in prison, wasn't it? Finally, yeah. after appeal, uh, where he uh, he basically kidnapped and tortured a, a, a man. And they said that, he could, as you said, he could be a criminal and he could still give evidence, but they described him as a ruthless, base and callous criminal mm -hmm. who was involved in an organised crime group. That's the headline. Yeah, yeah. Ruthless, base and callous criminal who was yeah. involved in an organised crime and, group. And said that still wouldn't have... have, have meant that he couldn't give evidence, but if he would have had to come and give a warts and all account mm. of his life. So, and this is, I think I did say this before, but in, in the US, if the mafia guys yeah. turn, they have to, first thing they have to do is they go into court and they confess all their crimes. Which is the get same in Italy in yeah. most places. Raphael Imperiali has yeah. six months to do it. He has yeah. to give them everything yeah. or else he doesn't get the deal. So Jonathan Dowdle, that was never the case. He wanted to spin everything and admit almost nothing 
while also excusing himself at every level. And that brings us to a few little points that have been made. And I think that, you know, coming out of this, um, if we navel gaze as a country, as a state, this is what we have to look at. Firstly, our witness protection programme is not enveloped in any legislation. No. Right? So we don't have those uh, rules and regulations on it that if you get in to the box, if you don't tell everything that you've done and you don't, you're not upfront and honest, yeah. deal is off. Yeah. Right? We don't have that. No. So we as a state have currently are in a position mm. that that ruthless, base, callous criminal, yeah. we are going to pay for him yeah. and his entire family yeah. to be protected yeah. until he's finished his prison term, he's released and he's relocated to a new country with a new life. Whether he lied, we, whether he whether lied, he lied yeah. or not, yeah, it doesn't matter. That's where we're at, and I think the most important thing out of this trial is, while obviously, you know, seeing Jerry Hutch walk out those doors as a free man is quite an extraordinary, yeah, um, point of time. I mean, this has been quite an extraordinary ten years for organised crime in this country and all the rest of it. That's one side of it, but the other side of it, and the more important thing is, who signed this callous, ruthless yeah. liar? Up? Yeah to the Witness Protection Programme. Yeah. Who told him, tell you what, let's put in a null prosecute for your murder charge. You can have four years, which you can appeal, and you might even serve, what will he serve on this? About two? Is he about two left to serve? Possibly. And then he's walking free. And, and you can bring your whole family with you, and the state will look after you. And it was interesting, actually, that in in, in the court, she made a distinction between... Um, she said you can't exactly know what happened, right? Mm-hmm. But she said the guardy displayed a distinct... It appeared to her, or I can't remember the exact terms, but something along the lines that it appeared to her that the guardy were unenthusiastic about yes. Jonathan Dowdle's evidence. we reckoned that, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. However, she said the DPP uh, obviously made a decision and that that decision was not uh, brought before the court I think the guards, the mm. guards uh, claim privilege, which he's t- entitled to do about what the DPP decided. Um, so that but was yet she said that this happens in courts she, across the country every day. And she doesn't know of another case yes. where they've ever claimed privilege to over, tell. over the DPP's because decision. Because when we talk about the guards not being enthused uh, about yeah. Jonathan Dowdall going witness or whatever, I think I'm, and I know I'm talking about the proper detectives yeah. who are working the beat yeah. on this case. I'm not necessarily talking about guard and management who are there making certain decisions yeah. here in the background with this as well. I'm not talking about the guards as a whole, and I'm sure you're not either. No. I am literally talking about the men and women that we saw in that court over yeah. the months who were yeah. worked the so guy, hard. Yeah, the guys who went through those hundreds of thousands of hours of CCTV exactly. to pick out bits of dirt on cars. And, and who were whatever. kept in the dark about operations that were going on by the National Surveillance Unit, by Crime and Security, who were they who were working kind of alongside them, but keeping them in the dark about information mm. they had in relation to this. I mean, in the end of the day, this was a murder. Yeah, there was a victim. Yeah. And it is the Garda's job and the state's job to try and find and convict a killer. Yeah. And there's been there's just and this judgment would certainly lead you to to have to look who made these mistakes? What mistakes were made? Yeah. How was Jonathan Dowdall signed up? Who did that? Who, who encouraged yeah, it? And I mean, what went on behind the scenes? I mean, who decided, I suppose, that that a murder charge would be brought against Jerry Hutch? Was there other options? I mean, we, we always say the guards have charged him. Um, but of course, it's probably, it's more complicated. The guards draw up a file. They send it to the DPP. They may re- make a recommendation that this person be charged with murder. Or they, but they don't have to either. They can just send the file and then the DPP decides what charge to bring. Mm. Um, so there was certainly, in this case, it was the DPP that decided to charge Sherry Hutch with murder. Mm. Um, it was. And, and, you know, look, I mean, to me, this is really where there should be calls for a focus into this and and the wider witness protection programme, which has always remained behind this sort of veil of secrecy. Uh, Very easy for the guards in charge of that, who again are crime and security, to say this is a matter of state security, not answering any questions about it. No. Yeah. I mean, how much has this cost? How much do you reckon this Regency investigation has cost the state at this stage? Yeah, I mean, well, could I you mean, even imagine? No, I can't. I can't. I wouldn't have a clue. I mean, a lot of money, of course. And then also, does the decisions made affect 
future investigations. Mm. And I think this will affect future investigations. Well, Jonathan Dowd all ain't ever getting into a witness box again. No, he definitely isn't. And, and you know, that is that is that is probably mm. the, the, the outcome of it. Um, so Jerry Hutch's hair is, is <laughs> extraordinary. And I wonder, is he going to go and get it chopped a little bit? Because he looks almost like a lion. Yeah, he's got his long beard, and his, he looks actually like somebody from Castaway, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's a very unusual situation. Uh, like Jerry Hutch cut his hair. <laughs> <laughs> no, the whole thing, right, Nicola? Because you know, even you know, G- Jerry Hutch has been described as a as a leading criminal for mm. decades, right? We all know that. Um, but he walked out of that court. I saw some little old woman, yeah, try and grab him. Get a selfie with him. Yeah. We walked, uh, we were part of the pack. We weren't one of them yeah. shouting at the questions at him, but we walked out with that pack of journalists. People were driving by in cars. Beeping. Beeping, go Roaring on. Roaring at me. Did on, he Jerry. get off? Did he get off? Yeah. And I'd say yes, and they'd be, yay. It's like as if you'd, you'd, somebody'd won a football yeah. match. Yeah, go on, Jerry. And I had a quick look at our Facebook page there, um, and it's just... You know, so it's just very unusual. And, you know, when I was standing talking to him inside the courts briefly there, like, you know, I have spoken to a lot of criminals. Yeah. And some of them are really very threatening. Their whole demeanour. Yeah. Everything about them. He's just not. No. And uh, that's not. It's just he, he has an ability, certainly. And again, he's been found not guilty here. So he, he, he doesn't have... um convictions no. related to violent crime anyway no. but for the kind of the the, the persona he is that the, 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 this leading member this senior organized yeah. crime boss as he's described he's um he's just he's not threatening and he's quite shy and he has definitely opinions on stuff he was given out for example about the picture that was used of him the other day and that's where it came from Again, it was kind of like the cops leaked that. And yeah. I don't think it was a vanity thing. No. It was just that, um, you know, he would be complaining about the cops in the same way the Burns, who were on the other side, the victim's family, yeah. would be complaining about the cops and accusing the media of. He'd be kind of of the same opinion. And that is just that. Yeah, I mean, it's, sort of, look, it's, it's, it's just a very unusual the way the public react to him. Um, yeah. Um, you know, and the fun, the tapes, of course, were... Like, it was very uh, Pulp Fiction, a lot of the tapes, wasn't it? Like, mm. you know, where they're just in Pulp Fiction, where they're discussing what's a cheeseburger and a, what they call <laughs> it in Belgium. So it was like, there was a lot of bizarre moments. But Jerry wasn't, he was quite sympathetic in the in the tapes, wasn't he? He wasn't, yeah, he, he was. wasn't a uh, was... show off or he wasn't. No, he wasn't unlike, trying to unlike... be a total hard man. So, like he, he so that all creates a perception of, mm. of, of Jerry Hutch in the public mind as a kind of a, a, a Robin Hood type of hero. I don't know or or really believe that that's justified. Mm. And I saw one uh, young Garda take aside a woman, or not take her aside, but just get annoyed at her. Yeah. Say, what are you? Why are you treating him like a celebrity for? Really. And you know, he just had a quick snap at her. Um. So there is, yeah. but I mean that that is the way people perceive him. Yeah. Um. I mean, you just can't imagine another criminal to come out no. of court like that and no. to walk up and down the street to be surrounded. No, I mean, if you think of the other more most notorious uh, figures linked to criminality, John yeah. Gilligan, yeah. people like that, absolutely not. So, look, I made a prediction that he would get off. Um, I should have put money on this this morning. <laughs> I actually should have. I was talking about it, and and I think that the right decision was reached. I think the right I, decision. I, I don't was think the, the. I think it was an excellent judgment. I don't exactly. It left I don't no think, stone unturned. I don't think you can or should be convicting people in a non-jury court on the base on the basis of the evidence we heard. No. I think the right decision has been reached. Mm-hmm. I do say I did feel a bit of sympathy for the Byrne family to see Jerry Hutch walk out and be uh, cheered in that manner, mm-hmm. but. And you that's know, the second person they've seen. Yeah. Member of the Hutch I family did, seen did, walk out I of that. I did feel a bit courts. of sympathy, and you know, in a funny way, you know, in those tapes, Jerry Hutch expressed some sympathy for 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 the the death of David Byrne mm. as well. Um, but incidentally, of course, there was two other guys there. Yeah, and they both uh, were convicted. Yes, uh, Jason Bonney and uh, Paul, Paul Murphy. Murphy, and we'll maybe go into the judgments against them in a little more detail yeah. later in the week. Yeah. But just to say that I 
like this is now I'm not going to go through those notes because I can't see them yeah. and there's so much of them but basically they were kind of both called almost ludicrous characters that yeah. they had come in to the court with these Jason Bonney that his his dead now dead father had been the driver of the car and this very complicated kind of day he was supposed to have had yeah. um, a witness that he brought to court who said that he and his father called to her house was um, she she was there was a very damning judgment made against her um, and of course uh, Paul Murphy said his taxi might have been cloned and that yeah. didn't no I mean he, he, I wish you could find the quotes now because they were quite well, funny there was, there was there was one there was a reference I mean Paul Murphy of course was was in his in his car was there was found to be a key card to get mm-hmm. into to Buckingham Village and he explained that by saying somebody left it in the back of his taxi and he just tried it out to see if it would work on Buckingham Village on the day and it did work. So there's just things like that that are um, that was, that maybe sound OK when you say them in a statement to the guards, but under the microscope of a court where they hone in on evidence, uh, it just wasn't really credible. I wish I could find this quote about Jason Bonney because I thought it was wonderful. And it was basically it was along the lines of how he ever thought for a second he could come into the court yeah. with uh, the way he did and try to present the evidence that he did was just absolutely bizarre. In other words, that he had kind of taken the piss out of the course that he'd come in with this yeah. tale, you know. Yeah. And obviously his brother-in-law, Paul Byrne, yeah. who refuted the evidence that it was William Bonney, Jason Bonney's father, that was driving the car and that had been involved in the Regency, essentially. Um, his evidence was taken as being yeah. It just shows you. I salad. suppose what it does show you is not all evidence is equal. Like you mm-hmm. know, if you have somebody to say I saw him there and somebody else to say I didn't see him there, once you get into a court of law and that starts getting cross examined and drilled into, they can sound very very different. Um, and the J- Jason Bonney produced two witnesses, and neither of which were were given any credence at all uh, in the judgment. Um, but so they, they, they were convicted, both of those. I have it. Go for it. This court was lied to in the most malevolent... Oh. Malevolent. Malevolent. It's easy for to say. <laughs> uh, and uh, Jason Bonney's dead father was implicated that anybody thought that these lies were acceptable yeah. is quite frankly amazing uh, that, you know, they were brought into the yeah. court. Yeah. So, so that'll be reflected, I imagine, in sentence. Yeah, I mean, they, they, so they, they've been convicted. They'll be back for sentencing. I don't know if a date was given, actually. I think it, it was, was, but I wasn't even listening. Yeah, Because um, so I was trying to watch what was going to happen here. Yeah, because I mean, know, that's really... going to walk out Yeah, because, I mean, he could have been brought back to the prison or, yeah. or secreted out. But so they will be brought back and they, they will be in a position then to give mitigation. Mm. Maybe, you know, say, maybe accept some of it and, and say what, what was the context. But that those sort of... Mm. What what the court clearly judged to be manufactured evidence will not stand in his favour for sure. Yeah. Now, finally, I suppose we leave it at this for today, but um, there was sympathy sent to the North, yeah. um, to D.I. Caldwell, who was shot so yeah. violently yeah. and the football pitch with his young child with him. Um, he had actually identified the photograph from the CCTV of flat cap being Kevin Murray. Yeah. Um, had given evidence in the case. Yeah, which was which was stark, really, you know, mm. um, because there is a kind of, a, I suppose, like there's a, it, it, it sort of reads like a comic book or a film, a lot of this trial. But I suppose you see with those, some of the, and some of the dissident stuff is quite kind of bizarre, nearly, isn't it? Mm. But you see the reality of 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 the effects of organised crime and, and, and terrorist behaviour when you see, uh, when you hear that read out, don't you, with, with Detective Caldwell who was Absolutely. shot in front of his son and mm. is still very, very un, unwell. And I suppose as well the, the, the way, the description of how David Byrne exactly. lost his life exactly. as well um, with six bullets at yeah. least. So look, well, we go and read this in full and yeah. come back tomorrow maybe and yeah, try and... I think, I think it's worth drilling into it maybe tomorrow, maybe more on Jonathan Dowdle and yeah, the implications so of that too. and what, you know, what happened because there was other things brought up about notes taken, mm-hmm. other things like that. So I think that's, you know, where Gary goes next is what everybody is stopping yeah. now asking me, like first of all, is he going to be found guilty? But now it's where is he going to go? Mm. 
there's all those things. But I think in terms of the broader implications, I think the Jonathan Dowdle, uh, what has happened with Jonathan Dowdle mm. will have broader implications that need to be looked at. Absolutely. So uh, what a day. What a day, yeah. I'm like starving, are you? I'm starving, <laughs> I'm starving, yeah. Now you gave me a Kit Kat earlier and I, I shared it with Ian, so I've had two fingers But you, you notice I didn't, I didn't share mine. Did you not no, eat all no, yours? No. And I've had like about 75 coffees. Yes, which, which is not a good good thing. No, no, they help. They're very good for the, you know, to, to, to push back the hunger. But I think I'm going to go and have something to eat. And later on tonight, yeah. I'm going to read this, my notes, which were excellent, actually. I have to say for myself, I nearly took them all. I was just never stopped typing. Yeah. Took as much down no. as I possibly could. This judgment obviously will be released publicly yeah. on the court's website, but it might take a few weeks for it to go up on that. And obviously it's it's an open public document yeah. for anybody who wants to read it. Yeah. So say your word. No, well, is it corroborate? Co- co- corroborate. Corroborate. Why did you get a problem with your orders? I don't. Well, I don't know. <laughs> malevolent. No, malevolent. Malevolent. Mal- malevolent corroboration. Malevolent corroboration. I can say both. Okay. okay. I'll know for tomorrow. Okay. Right. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, Nicola.